and welcome to Coffee with Kathy or Coffee with Pastor Kathy. So wonderful to come and be with you today. I'm excited because I have one of my favorite people in the whole world, uh, Iniva Gaka, Dr. Iniva Gaka. And um, Iniva does a lot of big things, which you will be hearing about today, but she also does a lot of little things, a lot of small things that turn into very big things. So I'm drinking from this cup and it says the little things. Um, on the inside, it says, life is good, enjoy the little things. And when I saw this cup, I thought about my mother and I, it was one of those things where I knew immediately that I had to have this cup. So welcome, Eneva. So good to be with you today and have a drink with you. And tell us a little bit about your cup. So today I chose uh, my probably the fa my favorite cup in the in in, in my cupboard, which is uh, my Winnie the Pooh cup. I mean, I want you to be able to see it. it it's a beautiful cup. Uh, it is. Uh, I I love Winnie the Pooh as a kid. And uh, uh, my sister actually bought the cup for me, and she has the exact same one. She came to be with me when I was uh, speaking at a conference in Miami. And at the time, she was living in Montreal. And so she came to be with me, and that's the one thing that we have together. And we know we can be drinking from the same cup. And my sister is extremely, extremely dear to me, so that cup is also very dear to me. And Eva, as you know, in my mind, you're one of those rare people that come along every now and again. And I'm not even sure when we met or where we were, but somehow you stuck. <laughs> I stuck with you. And I'm so excited that you've been attending Park Avenue for over a year or so. Your brother was here over the summer last year and he came along, Dee came along and, and was part of our church family as well. Track for us, if you will, sort of your background where you were born and raised and your parents from the continent of Africa, because I think it's so interesting. You've moved around a lot. You were a wanderer of sorts. So tell us how you got uh, So I was born in France and uh, you know, I mean, spend um, the most important part of my childhood uh, in Gabon, which is my father country. My father is from Gabon. My mom is from Chad. Uh, my parents actually met when my dad was doing his uh, mandatory military service in Chad during the war. And so um, I came here after high school. So after, well, actually, no, after high school, I was in France for like three years and then came to United States and landed in Kentucky, uh, where uh, I went to school. And after Kentucky, I went to um, grad school in Georgia and then California. And then I actually uh, went back to Kentucky for my uh, dental degree. And uh, then from there, I actually applied for residency, for hospital residency. and. Uh, match at uh, Montefiore Medical Center. So then I came here for what I thought would be a one year and then was um, invited to be a chief resident, so stayed a second year and then happened to get a job close by. So I'm still here and we, what, close to seven years <laughs> <laughs> I've been here. So uh, yeah, but yes, I've definitely been a wanderer most of my life. I. I think it's my parents' fault because they, they moved a lot. So I guess we have that moving gene in us. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and I love seeing new places and meeting new people. And so this has been great. Yeah. Well, we're so glad you landed here in New York City as well. Um, you're currently working on a master's of public health, but you yes. also have a seminary degree. Yes, ma'am. So tell do. us how you are coordinating that uh, seminary degree with your work that you're currently doing? Ah, wow, that's a profound question. Actually, um, I think my seminary degree um, has enriched me. Actually, I, I always say to people who ask me often where you've had a lot of schooling, what was the hardest? 
And of course, people would think that uh, dental school, professional school was hard. And don't get me wrong, professional school is grueling. But um, in terms of human experience, I think that seminary was the hardest because I went to seminary at Pacific School of Religion and I think almost all of our professor always ask us to defend our, you know, whatever we were thinking at the time and by asking us, well, why, why do you feel like that way? What is it about your own social location that make you think that way? And that sometimes is a hard work of introspective work of, of going back and looking at, yeah, why do I feel so strongly about this? And so I think like it requested um, a reflective work that uh, definitely enriched my life and I believe make me a better human because I had to sit in class and have conversation with people who came from very different background and very different way of looking at even their faith or theology of thinking of God. And so it definitely expanded my mind and help me see the world in a different way. So, and that I think helped me in my work every day in the sense that, you know, I mean, I have patients who come from every background and I am able to relate to them and to um, appreciate, to have an appreciation for people's faith and to know that faith is a big part of who we are. And also um, when people feel respected in their belief, it also helped for me in terms of my work of helping them um, toward optimal health. And Neva, I know that one of your most special gifts to me is that you are a very empathic person. You love mm -hmm. deeply. You, you love people that others may find difficult or maybe not even ever be able to love at all. And I know you have a passion for children. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think that, uh, well, I, I just like kids and they actually like me back. I think like there's a part of me that's refusing to grow up and um, we, we connect pretty good. Um, but um, actually talking about my love of children, my first graduate degree is in education. So I taught um, and uh, enjoyed teaching very much. I think that ultimately I may go back to teaching, not the little people anymore, but still teaching is something that is important to me. Uh, and also, even when I was in residency, when I was able to um, do, I mean, already as a first year resident, I, I, I requested a tweak in my program. So I went and spent uh, two days a week at the time at the National Kennedy Center for Children and Adults with Disability, which is part of Jacoby Hospital, but it's actually a part of Monty. That, that wing of the hospital is part of Montefiore. And so I was able to go there and uh, work and, uh, and, and get to be trained for children and adults who are sometimes very, very difficult to sit in the, in the dental chair. I mean, just to sit in general, let alone at the doctor. Um, and during my chief residency, I spent even more time there because I just, it was very important for me as a dentist to be competent, not only with the person that everybody wants to see that looks good, that maybe, um, you know, have the perfect teeth and just require a cleaning, but also for the people who don't have the same access to care. And I think that's something that I've always had in me, but going to school in Kentucky, which actually uh, usually fight with West Virginia for being the state with the most dentalist people, um, you know, I saw, I saw children that had decay in adults who were like in their 20s and 30s and have lost most of their teeth. And, that affect health because it affects what you eat, it affects you know, your presentation, getting a job and all that kind of stuff. And so I participated already there as a volunteer for the sealant program and went to the Appalachian Steel Children Teeth. And so that's just something that's very important to me, making sure that people can feel good about themselves because you know the face is one of the very first things that we see 
and children unfortunately none of us choose where we are born and so some of us are luckier than others because it's just about family values and education and so it's very important for me to be able to treat as many of my patients as possible thanks be to god I know you're also part of one of the small groups that we formed over the past five or six weeks um, under the advent of COVID-19. And you shared with me a wonderful story about a discussion you led in your group uh, a couple of weeks ago about St. Francis of Assisi. And so could you share with us why you chose that particular prayer and your connection to it? Well, I chose that prayer because it's one of the first prayer that I remember connecting with. I mean, my, uh, my father is from a Catholic background. I grew up going to Catholic school, girls Catholic school. So I wasn't in a co-head environment. Um, but, you know, it was like we had prayer every day and we had compulsory chapel. You know, the kind of thing that when you're a kid, you don't always appreciate. But for some reason, some of those things stuck with you. And uh, the prayer of St. Francis has always been with me um, through just the prayer. But the prayer was actually given to me by uh, um, what we call in French a Clarice sister, which has to do with St. Clara of Assisi. And of course, he, um, St. Francis helped uh, in, um, in establishing uh, the sister of St. Clara. And so... I have a lot of fun memory as a kid spending time going to the, to the convent in my country because um, my parents used to go and help in giving food and stuff like that because they're contemplative. So they pretty much pray and don't do a lot of activity on the outside. And then when I went uh, to college in France, I happened to also be in a town where one of the very first convent in France for the Sister of St. Clair was, and I was asked to give something to another sister there from the sister in Gabon. So I went there and it's just a place that as I was away from home for the first time and away from family, which is important to me, I mean, I'm one of six children, so I grew up in a large family. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was a place where I could find peace. I've always been able to find peace, I guess, in chapel and in those kind of space. And so, and again, when I went there, one of the sisters gave me that prayer and gave me the cross, which is, um, I mean, I've been, I've lived it here in the United States for over 20 years now. And wherever I've been, that cross is always on the top of my bed. So it's just something that I connect deeply with. And I wanted to share that with my group. And, uh, so I hope they appreciate it. <laughs> sure they did. I'm sure they did. Um, almost from the beginning uh, of our relationship, you have used a term to call me. Uh, you call me Mama Kathy. And uh, culturally, we both know that these titles, these names, uh, these words mean a lot. And so why did you do that? Why did, you, why did you start calling me Mama Kathy? Because that's just what you are. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean you, you in my life, you in my circle of mothers, I know you, you keep me straight a few times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, by the, time, by the time I finally honored the fact that you had asked me to come and visit your church, I mean, I had known you outside of the church for much longer than I've known you inside the church. And so, yeah, I, and it's just like, that's who you are. I mean, I know you are Pastor Cathy, but I think that more so than anything, you my Mama Cathy first. <laughs> You know, and of course, I come from an African upbringing where, you know, the people who are close to you, you, you bring them home. And so they become family. I know, like, uh, growing up, it took me a while, actually. I was, I was in my 20s and even 30s when sometimes I realized, because, you know, as you get older, sometimes you ask questions, I'd be like, asking my mom or my dad, so how is this person my uncle, by the way? And say, 
oh no, there's no blood. I mean, like, you know, we, we've known each other since like high school or something. And so, but that's, that's just the African upbringing. And I guess like being here, there's always a duality in the sense that I grew up in the African upbringing, but I'm also here where people, um, it's, a, it's a different culture. But there's certain things, I guess, um, that I like about my culture and that I want to hold. And then I would not think to call you by your name. And if my mama was around, she'd be like, what the heck is wrong with you? It raised you better. <laughs> and so, yes, yeah, so I have plenty of auntie, mama. I'm, I mean, it took, it took a village to make this person that I am. And so thank you for being part of my village. Gosh, and thank you. It is... Um a title that I hold very dear, having had a, an amazing mom and having mothered two sons myself, it's something that I am so humbled by and delighted to have a daughter. Delighted to have you as my daughter. <laughs> amen, amen. As a healthcare provider in the midst of this pandemic, um, what would you have people to do? What, would, what, what should we be doing? Um, in light of this? What are your hopes for us? Well, I hope that, um, I think the biggest thing for me is just that people continue to wash their hands, you know? I mean, like, um, one of the things that people don't realize is that, like, for a long period of time, a woman died during childbirth because the doctors didn't know to wash their hands. And actually the doctor, I can't think of his name right now, who actually thought about the importance of washing the hand, he was actually killed because his, his colleague at the time thought he was crazy. And you know, it's after that it was revealed that yes, it made a difference. But you know, it, he wasn't appreciated at the time. And so, you know, the importance of washing their hands. I mean, I always, anybody who knows me knows I have lotion everywhere. I mean, in my car and in so many different places because as a dentist, I know we have the, uh, the Purell and all those, uh, you know, things we can use to just like, kind of like clean our hands really fast, but there's nothing like washing your hand. And, uh, I work with uh, assistant and staff in clinic who are always telling me, Dr. Neva, you wash your hand off. I wash my hand every time I enter a room. I wash my hand every time I get out of a room. So I wash my hand so many times over the day that I, I have lotion all the time. But so it is so important for people to understand the importance of washing your hand. I mean, like usually your skin is a pretty good protection unless you're wounded or something but you're gonna wash your hands because we touch our face we touch our eyes and so i hope that that's gonna stick you know with people long after this is uh gone and that we are you know i love to see that in certain place they are educating children about washing their hands at um at school and I know that even I as a healthcare professional every year as part of uh, OSHA which is uh, infectious control for us one of the exercises that we have to do is to wash our hands and then we have a substance that we put to see where the place you, meet, you miss and even for us as healthcare professionals sometimes we miss that's why it's so important to do it properly to do it for the required amount of time and to do all the side and go in between and make sure this is an area that people miss often between the time. And so it's very important to do it properly. And it's a very small, you know, you're talking about a cup and small thing. It's very small, but it makes such a big difference. Wow. And so I really hope that people are going to, you know, that is going to be become second nature. Because a lot of people don't wash their hands. I mean, like coming out of the bathroom, a lot of people don't wash their hands. And so, uh, mm -hmm. what are you learning about Geneva these days in the midst of, of this uh, being at home and, and change of life? What are you 
discovering new about yourself? Uh, I think I think I've been aware of that before, but um, because I'm a person, yes, I go to work and I can be very social, but I'm I'm very much naturally of an introvert. I mean, I like being in my house. I don't have a TV. I'm a person. I like the, the time that I spend in quietness is is a time that I cherish. So I probably do. I may be doing this more easily than other people because I'm, I'm the kind of person. Give me a good book, and I can be home for like three weeks, right? <laughs> so, um, but the one thing is just that. Uh, I've had to be there for um, a lot of people um, whom I love dearly and some of them I haven't talked to in a while. And it just reminded me of the importance of connection, of staying connected. Because I think for many of us right now, we have probably reached out to people to whom we had not talked to in, in a while. And not because, you know, we were angry with each other but because a lot of time we don't take the time and i think that uh one of the things that i will that i'm trying to implement for myself is just to be more intentional on you know letting the people that you care about that you think about and that you love that hey you know I mean, right now there's Zoom and all those kind of things. I mean, we've all, I think, Zoom and FaceTime more than we've ever done before. And we've realized that, you know, it is a way to stay connected. And uh, so that's something that I've learned. You know, you, you get time to spend with yourself and you realize, mm -hmm. oh my God, you know, this person, I've totally neglected them. And so just uh, fostering and trying to keep those connections alive because it takes work. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, God bless you, my dear. And thank you so much for talking and sharing of yourself all the time, but especially today so others can get to know how fabulous you are. I was thinking about this because one of my mom's favorite poems was a poem called The Little Things. And she used to love to recite it whenever she had opportunity. And I don't know, none of us know where she found it or where she got it from, but I wanted to share that today. Oh, please. It's not so much the things I do that causes me regret. It's the little things I leave undone, the mm -hmm. things that I forget. The words I fail to utter, the songs I fail to sing, the letters I fail to write that may great comfort bring, the sick I fail to visit, the flowers I fail to send, the hand I fail to offer unto a fallen friend. It's not so much the things I do that causes me regret, it's the little things I leave undone, the things that I forget. Mm. And so I thank you for the little things. I thank you for the big things. I thank you for your heart and your love and your care for humanity. And I want to pray with you and for you as we sign off now. Of course. Yes, yes, yes. Gracious God, thank you for this beautiful and amazing soul, this woman that you have crafted and given to the world. Thank you for all the ways that she lets her light shine. We pray for her family who are scattered everywhere, for she belongs to the universe. She belongs to all of us her mother and father and sister and brothers, and nephews and nieces, for patients and administrators and colleagues and all whose lives she touches. Bless her and keep her, O oh God, in your tender care. And may her, the love that she gives out be returned to her many times over. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Coffee with Kathy. This podcast is brought to you by Park Avenue United Methodist Church. Follow us on social media at PAUMCNYC. You can also support our ministries by donating at PAUMCNYC.org slash give. We hope you've enjoyed this coffee with Kathy. Until next time.